Greetings, everybody, and um, welcome to this Australian Studies Centre's webinar, where we will discuss Root and Branch, Essays on Inheritance, this wonderful book. Um, before we begin, um, we are lucky that um, this event can be uh, uh, properly um, um, prefaced by, by, by Auntie Diane Kerr, who will um, um, provide us with a welcome to country. Diane. Indeed, thank you, Diane. Um, thank you for your kind words and thank you for wishing on this um, webinar, um, uh, the grace of, um, of your ancestors. Um, I should also add that um, I speak for Jara, from Jara country, and um, you know it is what happens in webinars that uh, mm. uh, many people are in place in different locations and speak from different um, country. Great. So this is what's going to happen today. Um, um, I'm going to. To, to introduce the presenters, um, one of which is me, and, um, and, uh, and the other being the author of this book, Ida Gunaidin. And um, uh, Ida and I will, will, will have a conversation um, uh, and this will last about um, 20 to 25 minutes. And, um, and it will not be a random conversation. It will be a conversation about the book and about um, the themes that emerge from reading the book and engaging with it. And, um, and after that, we'll have a, um, a question and answer session, a Q&A session. And um, I, should, um, I should add that uh, there is no chat available in this webinar, but um, um, the Q&A will sort of... Uh, be based on, on, on the questions that uh, shall be re received um, um, during our conversation. Um, so um, the presenters. Ida is a Turkish-Australian essayist and researcher whose writing explores class, capital, intergenerational trauma, and diaspora, life in the diaspora. Um, you can find her work in the Sydney Review of Books, in Mianjin, in the Lifted Brow, and, and others outlets. She's been a finalist for a Queensland Literary Award and the Scribe Nonfiction Prize. And uh, Root and Branch is um, her debut essay collection. Um, your other presenter is me, is um, an honorary senior fellow at the Australian Centre. Uh, the organizer of this uh, of this webinar, and teaches history and politics at Swinburne University of Technology. Um, my research has focused on the comparative history of colonial system and settler colonialism as a mode of domination. Um, I authored a few books, um, but um, uh, the reason I uh, um, I feel privileged to to speak about um, Ida's book is that um, um, my, my intellectual journey, my research agenda over the last two decades has been on the exploration of um, sovereign displacements, which is a fancy word to indicate colonialism. Um, and, um, and I believe that uh, Ida's work and, and mine engage in productive ways in, and um, hopefully, throughout our conversation, we, we can tease that out. So, um, um, here is the reasons why I think this is a wonderful book and um, I think people should read it, people should engage with it and uh, people should own a copy. Um, Let, let me let me start um, with Cicero. Ubi bene, ibi patri. Where it is well with me, there's my country. 
or translated in a different way, my home is wherever I am well. It was a manifesto for the extension by assimilation of Roman citizenship and for setting up colonies of settlers in conquered provinces. But this expression has had a long history um, after the fall of Imperial Rome. And Cicero's words are relevant for emigrants. They move and they may find a new home. And Ida reminds us that distance from one's home is, and I'm using her words, to suffer. Ida also cites a Turkish proverb that riffs on Cicero, that the homeland is where one grows to fullness. But, and spoiler alert, don't listen to what I'm saying if you um, haven't read the book or if you don't want to be, um, um, if you don't want it to be spoiled, uh, because I'm about to reveal what the book is about uh, and its conclusion. Here is the question. Can you be well after trauma? Ida's book is about migration and trauma and many more things. She says migration as trauma, indeed as the originary trauma. Again, I'm using her words. And remains ambivalent. There is no migrant success story, she concludes on the one hand. And yet, while the book is about yearning and longing, both ultimately unfulfilled, the book also concludes, and in my opinion, culminates, on her reflection on an original, a new original, not a copy of an old place, but the Western Sydney Turkish suburbs of a youth. It is a synthesis, and like all synthesis, it is expressed by way of a double negation, not multicultural assimilation and not preservation or replication of an old land. It does is a true immigrant diasporic place. So, this is a book that talks to me personally, politic politically, and in scholarly terms. I feel privileged I was given the opportunity to engage with it. And, um, and, and I hope that Ed and I, in the, in, 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 in the conversation that will follow, uh, will be able to, to address um, each of these aspects, the personal, the political, and the scholar. Um, uh, Ed at one point confesses to entertaining the fantasy of readers who would find her work relatable. And um, I have a complimentary fantasy. I always fantasize about being a relatable reader. Um, uh, uh, so here is my test. I'll start from the personal. Ida, I am a migrant. Um, I will not stay here. I am a settler, but I'm going home. Uh, Australia has a solid tradition of immigrant studies, but this tradition has been dormant in recent years. Mm. And uh, your intervention is welcome. Uh, the reason for this silence, in my opinion, is that the multicultural state has been now decommissioned, just like the white Australia policy state was once discontinued. There is no way back to multicultural settler colonialism, just like there once was no way back to the white Australia policy state. The landscape has changed. So the scholarly reflection on immigration was dormant, but Ida reminds us that the crisis is worth looking into. Can you be well where you do not belong and never will? And an immigrant by definition does not belong because if they belong, they are already settlers. Also and again, can you be well after trauma? This is a crucial question, especially because an immigrant by definition displaces literally and in psychological terms, which means that an immigrant by definition never gets a chance to address trauma. This trauma does not end because it is not a matter of when it ends, but where it ends. And there is nowhere in there. Ida. Um, <laughs> well, gosh. Uh, Thank you for setting me up so well, Lorenzo. Um, firstly, um, I also want to acknowledge that I'm zooming in today from Gadigal country. Um, I have just moved house, so hopefully you will forgive the kind of dormant chaos behind me. Um, but I've lived on Gadigal land for about five years, but I grew up on Darid country where I, I feel you know despite 
being a second generation migrant and kind of being someone who's experienced displacement myself, where I have also enacted my own forms of displacement. And I hope that this work um, reflects as much as it can on migrants' participation in settler colonialism. Um, but I was also very, I count myself somewhat fortunate to have been kind of nourished on this country. Um, and I also count myself fortunate to be surrounded by esteemed colleagues and friends today and to have been read so closely by you, Lorenzo. So <laughs> thank you. Um, I have to say one of the ultimate compliments I've received on this work so far is from you just then when you implied that it was in some way dialectical. <laughs> I guess I hadn't contemplated that that is what I was doing. Um, but yes, I think you, you've, you've set up the concerns of the work um, wonderfully. And so I'm also appreciative and I hope you take it as a compliment if I call you a relatable reader or uh, an enlightened witness, if you like, to this work. <laughs> uh, great. Um, um, I wonder if, um, if, you, if you feel comfortable um, addressing the, the, the question of your particular um, subject position, because you see, you're a second generation um, immigrant. Mm -hmm. um, in the multicultural strictures, um, you should be well over the, the trauma of migration. Um, everybody knows that second generations um, 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 forget their, 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 their roots. Um, they focus on the branch mm -hmm. and um, and um, and um, and so uh, um, you you yes. I wondered if you if you if you wanted to to add um, to this um, um, to to your exceptionality in the literature on 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 what happens to to immigrants, what happens um, to the branches. Ah, uh, okay. Um I suppose I should go on the record as saying that I'm not someone who's ever gotten over anything. <laughs> um, so why start now? <laughs> um, and yeah, I know you were being a little glib about about that, but yeah, yeah, yeah I'm quite firm in my view that um, one never recovers or heals entirely from trauma. And let's say that migration generally is a form of trauma you know usually when one leaves their home they're leaving because of the things that force them to leave um and i think that a way in which these kind of multicultural projects australia being an example as you said of an attempted kind of multicultural project is that second generation migrants are told that you know they are Australian that kind of tamps down on any residual loyalties they may have to other imagined homes because of course I, I don't think that the homeland is our home either um, but in order for multiculturalism to work the migrant is told that they must be happy at least the second gen migrants who are given several kickbacks like an education like class mobility you know I have probably as a result of growing up here been able to access tertiary education which my parents were ne never able to have and a much higher standard of living i will almost definitely um live for longer than my parents etc etc um but i guess i'm not convinced that those are really the ingredients for <laughs> for happiness but I think we're also kind of sold the myth or the lie in, in this country that migration is one of those traumas that we recover from. <laughs> um, so yes, as far as reflecting on my own subject position, I think that, um, yeah, as I said, I was, I was born in the Western suburbs 
of Sydney and I grew up there and then I was schooled there as well. Um, and then I kind of completed my undergraduate degree at the University of Sydney, which I reflect on a little in one of the essays. And then I've been working as an academic and an essayist ever since and hopefully trying to bring some kind of um, ethic <laughs> of possibly leftism to all of those works as much as it's possible. <laughs> um, but I'm convinced that that ethic, its origins are, have been given to me, not from my studies, but from, you know, my parents and, and their experiences. So I'm hopeful I answered part of your question at least. It, it, I, I was celebrating your nonconformity with the catechism of the multicultural state. That was a project I, um, I, I always was suspicious of. And um, um, uh, I, I also um, engage with your ideas that um, displacing um, uh, doesn't enable uh, facing trauma. Um, and, you know, um, immigration is literally a displacement. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, so in a sense, I wanted to, to, to introduce um, this notion that um, emerges in conversation with your book, that of, a, um, we could call it uh, emigro pessimism. We could, uh, we could set up a new school, uh -huh. you know, the notion, uh -huh. the notion that, um, um, that there is no remedy that uh, migrants inhabit the space that one can carve between ejection and rejection um, or qualified acceptance, which is a compound of both. Um, and they try and make a living walking away from a country that hates them and they head towards a country that does not want them or is indifferent, which is even worse. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, if you see from the perspective of migrants, uh, for migrants, it's in, it is never sovereignty. We witness a settler's colonial sovereignty that is asserted and remains defective. And conversely, we witness an indigenous sovereignty that is denied and yet endures. But for migrants, sovereignty is always elsewhere. Mm -hmm. For indigenous peoples and for settlers, sovereignty is political life. But for migrants, sovereignty is like um, the Epicurean understanding of death. Migrants will never encounter their sovereignty because if migrants are, then sovereignty is not because they have already left. And if sovereignty is, then migrants are not since they are already settlers. Migrants are the unsovereigns. I see no remedy. Hmm. Um, their subject position is marked by contempt, contempt for settlers, for natives, for other migrants, for those who have stayed home and for ourselves. Um, so this is my question. How do you feel about emigro pessimism? Uh, us academics are now coinages, huh? Isn't that, <laughs> I'm very charmed by that term. Um, <laughs> but I think you've painted a very, I suppose my immediate reaction is that you've painted a somewhat bleak picture, which can in its own way be liberating i think that you know being forced to sublimate or deny our own grief and trauma especially as second generation migrants and act as if everything were better and therefore healed is not very satisfying to me i think that there is no harm in sitting in a little pessimism sometimes possibly only if it actually encourages us to engage in or at least to stop fantasizing. I think what strikes me about the kind of, a lot of the canon, the, I guess the diaspora literature canon, which possibly starts from a place of contempt of, you know, being here under not ideal circumstances, often fantasizes about the homelands. And I think it's important, especially for second gen migrants to and we all have that moment, I think, where we realize that what we've been entertaining as the homeland is not really our homes. It's not a place we could ever realistically call our homes, especially now, you know, I would be considered a Westerner, which comes with its own set of, quote unquote, privileges. But 
I suppose what I'm trying to say is I think that it's important to give up the fantasy and possibly step into a place of, into a place of pessimism only if it only encourages us to actually engage with our material realities, which is that for better or worse, where we are is here. For better or worse, what we are is settlers. <laughs> so how can we actually materially, substantively engage with decolonial struggle here and now? <laughs> um, a, and then B, I think that this pessimism is important to embrace if it helps us to kind of detach ourselves from um kind of reactionary nationalism which i think is another thrust in this kind of diaspora literature either people conclude that they're aussie which <laughs> is not very satisfying to me or in kind of yearning for the homeland i see a lot of people kind of become sort of patriots um and I'll only speak to the Tur Turkish experience, but the Turkish kind of nation state itself is the remnant of um, an imperial actor <laughs> who has is, is created many, many displacements. Um, and Turkish nationalism, just like Australian nationalism, just like almost all forms of nationalism, uh, requires... Um, kind of difference to be erased or kind of painted over so yeah when you say there is no remedy <laughs> i think that you are probably right but just because these wounds don't heal i think doesn't mean that we can't still live existences that are meaningful and valuable <laughs> uh thank you ida um uh, for two reasons. The first one is that, um, of course, um, 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 pessimism shouldn't be a, a, a justification for inaction or for fantasizing about the old land. Um, um, uh, I, I can assure you there is no fantasy about Italy here, none whatsoever. Uh, what, <laughs> um, what I know, it's a country that's um, no longer there. Um, and um and in and, and also yes no 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 justification for inaction but um but um but it is important in my in my opinion to also abandon the fantasy of uh, the multicultural state mm -hmm. um and um and to 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 embrace the struggle here which as you as you point out in your book and you mentioned um um, the struggle here is for decolonization, right? Um, and um, that brings me to, 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 to what I thought was um, the more political part of our, uh, of our conversation. Uh, um, reading your book, I, I wondered, and um, I've been thinking about this, this question for quite some time. I wonder whether, whether you you are of the opinion that um, revolution may travel. Um, this is my question, my million dollar question. And um, I'm not talking about a million Italian liras here. I'm talking about, you know, um, more valuable currency. Um, uh, um, can revolution travel? Um, I'm not talking about storming some palace in some capital city, but about the practice and possibility of emplaced change. Um, what, when you were talking about material connecting, materially connecting with the place, uh, uh, I think we, we 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 would agree on a definition of, um, of, of 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 revolutionary change. And so my question is, um, can it can it travel? Mm. Um, um, you you what what I think are possibly the most precious pages in in your work are when you when you describe the experience of your father. He, he was a, a, a political being in the old place and um, the struggle, you know, left him. That's, these are your words uh, on, on arriving here. And, um, and, uh, and, and so I do relate with, uh, with, with your subject position. I do relate with, with the experience of your father as well. Um, so how do we transport revolution? How do we make sure that in place change can be 
can can travel with the migrant? Um, gosh, that question is worth much more than a million dollars if you ever crack it i think we'll we'll be very rich um <laughs> yeah i guess i almost want to start by answering from a kind of political theoretical perspective only because that is part of my academic background i spend at least a little bit of time teaching and learning about middle eastern politics and so to take your question quite literally thinking about a recent revolution that almost traveled i think of the arab spring and its associated failures <laughs> and the kind of elite capture that took place but also the ways in which a lot of contemporary social left or left aligned revolutions are forced to fail by surrounding international actors like i think of northern syria and then the other, and then the political theorist in me thinks about, I don't know, the attempt to foment communism in the 20th century and how it would be considered a failure, despite the fact that it so very nearly succeeded. Um, so I guess when I look at those two things and I think about whether or not revolution can travel, I think that what can travel is ideas maybe but also, as you said, kind of revolution or change needs to be in place, i.e. enacted by local actors who are working in a kind of grassroots fashion on building, um, whether that be workers power or solidarity or these terms that we talk about in the abstract. Um, and then I guess my second answer, maybe a less disinteresting one about whether or not revolution can travel I think that what can travel is, and what did not travel in my father's case, is revolutionary fervor. <laughs> That's the only thing we can carry with us across borders, <laughs> which is um, a, a kind of belief that better things are possible. A good friend of mine has this kind of metaphor when he talks about the idea of trying to build socialism, where he says that um, I'm sure he didn't come up with it, but I'm still, I like the idea. He says that it's socialism is kind of this house that we've all decided to try to build in our lifetimes with the knowledge that by the time we die, we won't even be slightly close to it being finished and we will never get to live in that house. But still we make that choice every day <laughs> to try to build a little. So when I think about revolutionary fervor <laughs> and how to keep that kind of fire burning I think of art actually, um, <laughs> and I think of all the kind of revolutionary poets that I cite in this book and the music that I listen to as being one of the few things that kind of keeps me from stepping fully into complete nihilism. <laughs> right. But yeah, maybe that's not a very good answer, but it is my answer. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a wonderful answer. It looks like we rehearsed this because you see, <laughs> When you, if you, you know, when you mentioned the, the, the housing metaphor, mm -hmm. uh, that leads straight to what I wanted to talk next, because I wanted to touch on your work on gentrification. Uh -huh. And, um, um, and, um, and um, I think that, um, that uh, uh, um, when, when you speak about gentrification, you, 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 you understand it as a form of colonialism. Um, um, uh, you know, uh, gentrification in, in the suburbs is both literally the expulsion of um, indigenous people away from um, desirable location, but also it's about the, 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 the suppression of migrant super diversity. You, you know, the, the idea is that uh, um, um, the, the, the experience of immigration uh, builds super diverse suburbs and then gentrification sort of normalizes them. Um, um, uh, and, uh, and um, you know, gentrification is about the conquest of a place by people who bring their property with them um, and displace whoever was there. Um, and, um, and, uh, and at one point you, you, you talk about ungentrification you know, um, these, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new term 
Um, and, you, and you describe it as a form of decolonization. And, um, and I think that's one of the, the most valuable insights in, in, your, um, um, in your book, emerging from your book, because uh, ungentrification is, um, is, uh, is more than simply opposing gentrification in, in, in not in my own backyard kind of uh, uh, movement. And I wanted to, to, to ask you to, to see if you had anything to add. I, I'm really tempted. I found this, this, this prospect very, very seductive. Hmm. Oh, thank you um, for saying that. Yeah, I think that as someone who has lived gentrification, both kind of experiencing it, but also enacting it, I think that what, and for context, is the particular essay that we're discussing is called Second City, and it kind of looks at um, Parramatta, which is in the western suburbs of Sydney, and how it is kind of viewed as an, an up-and-comer suburb. It's going to be the second CBD of Sydney very soon. And I kind of spent some time working there in 2013 and then again in 2017. Um, and even in that short span of time, things changed, which I can kind of chart against my own kind of class mobility. I started off as a kind of working as a, a waiter there. And then I started working at um, an arts organization. And I think that once I started thinking about gentrification, which we on the left kind of all agree is, is a social harm because of the fact that um, the improvements in living conditions that are introduced to an area are the exact ones that displace uh, the inhabitants of that area away from it. But I think what I find a little unsatisfying about thinking about gentrification in a way that doesn't also take account of settler colonialism is that the history of this continent is one of displacement. So um, I guess the question becomes how far back do we wish to wind the clock? Who are the original inhabitants of the western suburbs of Sydney? It isn't just um, kind of multicultural Sydney. It is indigenous people um, who can very clearly chart their very, very recent um, history in that place. So I don't know that I do have a lot to add, to add except to say that I think that um, I've at least observed in a lot of modern anti-gentrification movements, especially the ones, there is a lot of activism happening in Parramatta now, resisting the, the urban development taking place there, um, you know, fighting back against the cutting down of certain significant trees and tearing up housing and heritage buildings i still find it often to kind of center uh, the european or the white or the settler history of that place and it just feels kind of disconnected from broader decolonial um struggles so possibly i'm not adding a lot except to say that <laughs> most of our politics when they fail to engage with um the material reality of colonialism on this continent, I think it will possibly be doomed to failure. Right. Uh, so the, the, the emigre pessimism uh, um, <laughs> reigns supreme. Oh, God. Listen, God. Um, uh, hearing your words um, made me think how, how privileged we were all, you know, um, um, having um, um, anti-Diane Care opening. Um, and welcoming us to this webinar by, by, by explaining to us um, how Melbourne was overimposed on, on Aboriginal land and how you can see this, um, um, this, 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 this imposition, because an overimposition is indeed an imposition. Um, and, um, and so, um, Yes, I, I wondered. You see, because um, in your book you 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 you, you em embrace a dialectical um, um, a method, and this is incredibly productive. I find it. Um, um, you know, um, we'll get to the scholarly in a bit, but um, 
Um, I wonder if, um, if your dissatisfaction with um, the anti-gentrification movements um, can be related to your um, um, recognition of, um, of the revolutionary practice that you encountered uh, while um, traveling in Germany and, and you are able to, to tell us about in, in your book. So um, what is it in these two location that, um, that, um, that is conducive to, to genuine um, anti-capitalist and um, revolutionary action and, and, and not. Mm. So there is a tension there between these two locations and I wanted you to tell us more. Yeah. Forgive me you. if I'm insisting. No, no, no. I, I suppose the look you see on my face is one of realizing what a difficult question that is. <laughs> And um, the fact that my kind of expertise on Germany is limited to very small amounts of time spent in the gentrifying neighborhoods of Berlin, which have traditionally housed a lot of working class Turkish migrants historically, who kind of came as part of guest worker programs to Germany. In, participated in post-war reconstruction and then kind of stuck around and have been begrudgingly given citizen access to more and more rights as citizens by the German state and now in those very same communities and neighborhoods I guess to use your term Lorenzo imposed or superimposed over those communities are other kinds of groups including more recent refugees but also, you know, there's a kind of budding, actually historical kind of punk scene there and queer scene. And in fact, a lot of also Kurdish migrants live in the same neighborhoods that Turkish migrants do. And I'm sure in some ways do replicate the same tensions that occur in Turkey between kind of quote unquote ethnic Kurds and ethnic Turks. But I think what I found pleasing <laughs> about those particular neighbors, neighborhoods is that it seems like there is a really um, kind of vibrant degeneracy social mixing that happens there that I don't always see in Sydney. I think that Sydney is a, is a city made up of kind of several cities or at least several enclaves doesn't always lend itself to a lot of um, socioeconomic mixing. I think they kind of, not entirely uniquely, but somewhat uniquely separated along socioeconomic lines. Maybe I'm just speaking from my experience growing up in the Western suburbs, but I think what I found pleasant about Berlin at least, and I don't mean to say that it's some kind of utopia <laughs> compared to Sydney, but there is a kind of hopeful social and socioeconomic mixing that I see there and actually enacted kind of leftist politics, which once again, I'm sure exists in Sydney. So this is me only just in retrospect, realizing that I've been possibly overly optimistic about Berlin. And as you would say, Lorenzo, a little pessimistic about life in Sydney, <laughs> but I guess, the only other thing I would like to say about that is that I think that what can happen amongst a lot of diaspora communities is this kind of reactionary impulse sometimes where they, in some subsections, often can emerge as slightly more conservative than possibly because of the kind of temporal dislocation that happens where there's, a, I think, sometimes a cultural freezing that can occur. Um, but that isn't always the case. And I think that um, just seeing diaspora in its full vibrancy and complexity requires us to see that there are a lot of people living in diaspora in countries considered multicultural who are not quote unquote little old liberals, but are doing something completely different and original and truly radical. And I see that in Berlin at least. And that's not to say that I'm down on politics in Australia or anything like that. <laughs> right. God forbid. Um, now, 
if if that, if it's okay with you, um, we are running out of time. This is this is, I think, very enjoyable and productive. Um, but um, I want to have a a, a proper Q and A session. And um, so after the personal and the political, I want to briefly, briefly, briefly touch on on the scholarly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, look, I'm putting scholarly last because that is where it belongs. And um, um, uh, um, but I, I want to also say that your writing, and in particular the genre of your writing, this kind of autoanalysis and uh, autobiographic um, um, autoethnography, -ethno mm -hmm. I think it's very conducive to the exploration of um, what we could describe as the, the current dispensation. Once it was, we, once people were, were talking about conjunctures, but. Um, um, so you, you, you do not enjoy the new dispensation, uh, but, uh, but you offer precious keys to understanding it. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so let, let me talk about what you explore and why your, the genre of your writing is particularly uh, um, 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 enlightening. So you, 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 the new dispensation, as you describe it, but I'm sure many will relate, um, is that, um, that is defined by anxiety and precariousness. Um, and these, these are really unprecedentedly anxious times uh, where precarity is, is really defining um, um, people's life. And so I find that you're writing at the border of different genres, um, your, 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 your border writing um, is, is appropriate for the new dispensation. Um, and um, I would like to conclude asking you if you wanted to, to, to add something about um, the, 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 the disciplinary nature of your scholarly contribution. Um, um, I believe that if we want to analyze the precariousness and, and the anxiety that we are uh, facing, um, we should embrace your genre and um, we, we should embrace your ability to inhabit the spaces between scholarship and life. Um, and, and therefore we should embrace your book. So I want you to conclude. Uh, what, what else should I say other than, yes, please do embrace my book. <laughs> yes, you're right. We do live in uniquely precarious <laughs> times. And I suppose that the, I if, you know, if I were to justify what you kind of described as a method if you like, or if we were to call what I've done in this book and that writes in this kind of self um, reflexive or auto ethnographical way, if we were to call that a methodology, if I were to justify it, I think that the reason I do that is hopefully to, <laughs> um, is to reflect you know, in turning myself into an object of analysis, <laughs> I guess is what has been done here a little bit. Um, my goal is to link up the, you know, it's going to sound very trite to say, the personal with the political. <laughs> um, I think I started off as much more of a straight memoirist before I found the kind of form of the personal essay, which is always concerned. I think at least with having a thesis, you know, literally the back blurb of this book discusses the fact that I'm an argumentative person who seemingly always kind of has a point to prove as one recent reviewer also commented and which I'm proud of. <laughs> I think that autoethnography for me at least has allowed me to find a way to write with a thesis in mind. And whether that is one you agree or not with is kind of up to the audience of the reader, but um, I think I have a point <laughs> that I'm trying hopefully to make with this book, which is that being a materialist actually matters <laughs> in this day and age. Um, yeah, more than ever. Very good. Um, I think we should uh, we should have enough to 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 to, to have a a collective conversation now. Um, so I'm opening the the. Q and A uh, function on Zoom, and I see no questions. Which um, it's either a very good sign because there is nothing else to be added, or a very <laughs> bad sign. So um, yes, uh, do we have any questions from the from from 
the audience from those who were able to, to, to follow us until now. And if not, I have a question for Lorenzo. Oh, very good. Um, but I'm happy. I, to... um, I see none. So maybe it is because I am bad from seeing them. I don't know. Um, Ida, if you if you want, we can continue as uh, we okay. we wait. May I ask you what you think about this question of revolutions and the capacity to travel? I was kind of interested to hear you say that you you won't stay here, but at the same time you feel maybe if I'm getting it right, temporally displaced from Italy. You know, right. there is whatever you think of as as we've discussed, whatever we think of as our no longer exists, not just because of place, but also time. And yeah. what do you think of this question of revolution and place? Look, um, I have, um, um, I have, um, I've written a book about what happens when revolution sort of tries to, to move to a new place. And, um, and, uh, and uh, my, my response is that it doesn't. <laughs> I am a, I am a, a, a emigro pessimist through and through. Um, I saw I saw the displacements. I follow them. I follow the, the the political ideologies that promote the displacements. But basically, if you end up stealing someone else's country, you have already lost. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's a long story. Um, I, the, the very short answer is no, I do not believe it travels. But I believe it can travel back. Um, and so, so at one point in your book, you say you want to be buried in a free Turkey. <laughs> yes. Same here, but not Turkey, obviously. No, um, no. But uh, I can see that. Um, um, uh, that's that, that, that's probably worth a, a, a whole seminar series, but uh, but yes, I am I'm, I'm, I'm very despondent mm. in 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 observing revolutionaries in their journeys. Um, but we have questions, <laughs> so um, so we have Daphne um, who is asking. Um, um, whether you, you whether we whether Ada believes that um, um, your community has a specific responsibility towards First Nations people um, that is different from um, from um, from from the colonial responsibilities of the Anglo settlers from the colonizers, uh, yeah. and if 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 the two sets of responsibilities are different, Daphne is 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 inquiring as to what they may look like. Which is a great question. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that question, Daphne. I hope I can do it justice. And also, Lorenzo, you're very welcome to, to contribute to an answer. Um, I think that my answer to... I do, I suppose, try to discuss what I think the responsibility, the specific responsibilities of my and our communities look like. Um, and I think that has to do with groundedness in place. I think that we all have a responsibility to engage with the struggles of our neighbourhoods and our neighbours, including our co-workers, whoever <laughs> is around us, I think is someone we should try to call a, maybe to use an outdated tweet term, a comrade of some sort. Um, but in terms of a differentiated responsibility, I think that thinking about kind of my own community, if I were to, yeah, I guess the Turkish community, I think that our unique responsibility is to First Nations peoples, but also to kind of resist the, um, the reactionary um, strains that I see inside of our own communities, to resist the kind of blind ethno-nationalism that we see. So it's maybe kind of more, more of an internally facing specific responsibility that I see. Um, 
rather than one specifically towards First Nations peoples. But I'm also um, limited extremely in my knowledge and <laughs> thought on this topic, actually. So I don't know if Lorenzo has anything else to contribute. Um, uh, this this is a, a wonderful questions and um, and um, um, my feeling is that um, you see a migrant moves across space, but they don't move towards their country. It's someone else's country, and they know it, right? They can make a home, but they can't make a country. And um, and at least the migrant doesn't entertain the, 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 the settler fantasy of moving towards you, one's own country, right? So settler and migrants are driven by very different fantasies. They are both fantasies, but one is dangerous and, and dispossessory. The other is, uh, is realistic. Um, so so I, I, I do think that um, um, embracing a diasporic life um, is in itself a decolonial act because at least the settler says, look, I don't belong here. It's not my place, right? It's either a country that was stolen from indigenous people, if I believe the settlers, or it is a country that was not quite stolen from indigenous people, if you believe indigenous people, and you should. Um, so, so in a sense, I do, um, I do see the difference between the two subject positions. Um, and I see um, the colonial um, um, uh, outcomes from, from teasing out this, this distinction. We have another, another question from Jasmine. Um, Ida, what are your thoughts on first and second generations and eventual generations carrying responsibilities um, or, 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 or of the states their ancestors come from? Um, how does one take the struggles of the land people migrate to and those they have inherited from past generations? Um, hmm. And I should also say that this, this, this session will end in two minutes. So. <laughs> I suppose I have to be really efficient, <laughs> but I don't want to not do the question justice. Um, so yeah, thank you, Jasmine, for the question. It's not a repeat question, but my answer might be a repeat answer, unfortunately. I think that the responsibilities that we carry from the States are exactly, precisely those ones to continue on any kind of legacies of leftism that were started in quote unquote, the homeland, including to hold our home states accountable <laughs> and including to hold our kind of peers in diaspora accountable for, again, the kind of ethno-nationalism that I see reproduced here, as well as the kind of blind engagement with being okay with the kind of global political economy that we find ourselves living in. <laughs> but yeah, you ask how do we take on that struggle um, and my answer, again, is limited to thinking about the, the very neighborhoods that, that we live in, including our workplaces. <laughs> Maybe I just keep beating the union drum because of the kind of reading I've been doing of late and the fact that, you know, this discussion is taking place in kind of an institutional university setting. I suspect many of us here today are affiliated in some way with universities which are the home ground for A, culture wars in Australia right now, but also the possibility of like real change in terms of um, working conditions we're all living through. <laughs> Again, many of us, I think, are probably highly casualized, et cetera. Universities have been gutted. We've lived through unprecedented austerities. So and maybe I just have unions on the brain, but I think that is one of the few actually um, kind of practical ways we can think about carrying on <laughs> struggle um, where we are. So I suspect I should stop talking so that we can all go have lunch or something, but <laughs> yeah. Very good. So um, let, let, let me thank you all 
for, uh, for, 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 for your participation. And um, um, hopefully uh, uh, you, 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 this was, um, was interesting enough and um, you will be tempted to, to have a look at the book and to, to, to then engage with it. Yeah, thank you folks for being here. <laughs> it's been really fun. It's fun indeed. And thank you to Lorenzo as well for facilitating. Absolute pleasure. <laughs> Very good.